So now I am really happy to introduce uh, the next talk uh, by Johan Brichot because this is a new company in Belgium and I want to see more of them. And that's cool because uh, they are from the, Universi the Freie University Brussels and we are working together with them, so that's, that's cool. I'm really happy. Yep, thank you, Steph. Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm very happy as well to be able to present you uh, the first project of our uh, new Belgian startup company doing small talk. Um, those of you who know me before, I've been doing uh, small talk for 10 years in academia, and um, I'm now changing hats and uh, started this company. Uh, so I'm moving away from academia completely on my own in the wild in the industry. So what is this? It's a next plan. It's a software built in Smalltalk with Seaside. And it's uh, jointly created with the major uh, cultural center Vorat in uh, Ghent in Belgium. So we did an agile team there. So the company we created is Inceptive. So what is next plan? First of all, well, it's a collaborative event planning tool. It's aimed at uh, event organizers, uh, things like cultural centers, uh, festival organizers, uh, museums, and all the sort of all sizes. Um, so they're able to create and manage all their uh, event planning uh, in there. Uh, basically aimed at planning all the resources they need for every event. So it's been a... Uh, an agile team experience in the sense that uh, our company, Inceptive, we were actually um, responsible for doing the development in Smalltalk. And they were uh, the guys, the domain experts, they knew what they wanted. So they hired, they actually, well, they paid for the product, of course. And um, they did the user interaction design and the user interface design. So all the nice, fancy screenshots, uh, demo you will see. The visual interface is theirs, but everything that works very fluently behind it, it's ours. Um, so what is it? It's event planning, resource planning associated to these events, um, management of it, so if you have conflicting uh, schedules and so on, or contact management, um, planning, billing, reporting, and so on. I see that a part of the slide is falling off, so I hope I don't have too much uh, things to the right. So it's, of course, a, a seaside application. It's targeted at modern browsers. Uh, we're able to leave out Internet Explorer in this case uh, because it's really targeted at an enterprise, so we can actually force them to use a, a good browser. Um, it's built and developed entirely in Faro. It's also running in Faro at the moment, so all the uh, iteration versions, what we mean. So we have actually produced up until now, during the period of one year, 24 different versions for them to test, so every time adding new functionality, and those have all been running in Faro. Uh, using the goods database. Of course, the major uh, Smalltalk framework we are using is Seaside. And now, very recently, we are also porting it to Gemstone, which uh, I will talk about a bit later as well. So, what will I say in this talk? I cannot really, well, I can present you parts of, of Nextplan application. It took me two, uh, two hours to explain every detail. So, um, what I want to show in this talk, that Smalltalk and Seaside are really uh, good and very promising, well, not only promising, they are there, um, really an impressive platform to build highly dynamic web applications that really look like desktop applications. So we try to move away from the traditional experience you have as a web application user, but really have a running application inside your browser that more or less handles or more or less is able to give you the user interaction you expect from a desktop application. I will dive into some of the details, so I will have a couple of demos so you see the working of the application, but I will dive into some of the challenges we really experienced because all the rest is like standard small talk and seaside development. We've been doing uh, some updates on the local Ajax updates. I will talk to you about uh, what that actually means, you will see. Object-oriented databases, we've been using three different object-oriented databases throughout the development, just moving on uh, from one to the other for several reasons. And we've been using SVG and AJAX updates in Seaside. And then, of course, I will talk a bit about how we do testing and the porting to Gemstone. So this is, uh, where is my mouse? There is my mouse. So this is the calendar interface of uh, Nextplan. So if you log in, you basically see this uh, interface, which is an interface of horizontally, uh, you see 
all the rooms in your cultural center, and then you have the dates. Events are scheduled as the white uh, squares in the middle. What I want to show here is that all these things are very much related. Here we have an event, the film festival, which is actually distributed over several locations. But every uh, square in the calendar is actually a separate box, a separate event. Now the things are very much related in the sense that if you move over them, they actually are shown to be uh, related here. Uh, Pop-up box comes up here. Yeah. It's hard to keep my finger on this trackpad. So, and this gives you information about this event. So that's something they want to give them some information about this event. But what I show you is okay. What I actually can do is you can classify different kinds of events. And what basically means is that the color changes. Now it's very difficult to see. You see the border of the screen. It actually changes color here. So they have different kinds of events, external rents, internal rents, whatever. Um, in place editing, you see the film festival here. Well, let's call this just a film festival too. You see that we have to update all places around. That's basically my intention here. So I, I just for the fun of it, let me add a new one. You can see that you can do actually do drag and drop everywhere around and everything. Um, another thing, there are detailed schedules for an event. Detailing schedules also have an impact on how they show here. So the basic message I show you here and through this interface is that you have an object-oriented application where you can change in different windows, different parts of your data model, and you have to pro propagate changes everywhere around. That was a, a bit of a challenge to achieve without doing a full page refresh, because a full page refresh took some time. So, of course, Seaside is very good. Seaside allows us to program this just the object-oriented way. Every cell in this calendar is a separate seaside component. Same thing for these information bubbles you've seen popping up, the schedule, the detailed information about an event, and so on. All these things are components which are interrelated. They show data. If some part of the data changes somewhere, you have updates to be done at particular parts in your interface. So what we designed was that every operation you do inside this interface will actually trigger the same update mechanism, the AJAX update mechanism, which will basically do a component re-rendering of the components that need to be updated. That's cool because you can just do this very simple. Yeah, just do a global AJAX update in Seaside. We take every cell, just the one component which contains all the cells and these information bubbles that pop up, and we just say, well, do this one update. That was easy and simple because the thing you can just easily implement. Uh, it's basically just that piece of code there, two lines. Uh, after every operation, you just trigger that, and you do the entire update. That's easy, and it's universally applicable. Up until the point where our users started creating 30 different rooms and scrolled down the calendar to see about 20 weeks, and then he added just one event, and he had to wait like six seconds for the screen to refresh. Not good. <laughs> huh? um, so it re-renders too much because it was just that one cell which had to be re-rendered. Huh? So it wastes also in-place editing advantage. Everything you do in place, you just want to have a local update. And most of the time, your updates are pretty local. So what you do in an object-oriented application normally is if you have components and you are changing this one there, we know that this actually propagates changes to another one. So it becomes a dirty component as well. Have to update this again, and vice versa. So you have dependencies between your components, and you're modeling those using any kind of publish subscribe framework, announcements, and everything. And then the nasty thing comes in. It's a multi-user collaborative application. So having announcements and dependencies, messages thrown around between your components for your own session is great. But you also have to take into account that other people are working on the same calendar interface, and they're also changing things. And of course, the testers at our client, they were just sitting next to each other. I'm not seeing this. I'm not seeing that. Well, they actually saw that. Uh, but we actually wanted to avoid that, of course. So you have a collaborative interface. So we've been scratching our heads there. You have to take this into account. So you cannot just rely on your propagation there. If you want to implement such a 
updating mechanism, which just renders the components which have to be re-rendered, there are some pitfalls. So one of these pitfalls was that you cannot just rely on um, the changes inside of your local session. Also instance variable values, but for most C sites, uh, that would be uh, commonplace. So if you're doing a component update, you have to take care that you're not storing any old values in your instance variable. So you basically have to just reinitialize all those values again before you're re-rendering it. So the capturing of the concurrent changes was an issue. And then, that's nasty, you have to think about client-side behavior. You saw that I was able to move, drag, and drop the cells. I could do in-place editing. There actually is also multi-dragging, but I need my two fingers, and I cannot show, but you can drag multiple cells together, which you have to hold multiple keys. If you scroll the calendar, it will extend, and so on. There's a context menu, a right-click menu. All these things, if you re-render your component, some of them, of those JavaScripts, uh, have to be relaunched, others not. So you have to take care of that. You have to know, okay, I'm re-rendering, so I only have to do that. So we basically tried to create a big, good framework so we can use it everywhere and we're unable to. Because this same problem comes back in another interface and another interface of the application. But we could not come up, we could not create one single framework to create. So it's more like a design pattern at the moment. So whenever uh, I come back to it, maybe one day I will see crystal clear to me that you can actually just abstract this in a super class and just use it. So every updatable component will carry its HTML ID so we can refresh it client side. And we have a render content method, of course, which does the complete render. And we always separate this into a render internal. The render, component, the render content just generates your entire component, and the internal parts are in the render content internal. The script to update on, well, that's basically containing the jQuery script to refresh your inside. And the needs refresh, well, that's the clue to actually um, take into account concurrent changes. Because the needs refresh is something we specialize everywhere. Once, it takes a look at, have I received any changed messages? So if I, should I update? Have I received any announcements? And it goes to query the database. Has anything changed there? Should I maybe put in a value of another user? And that's basically, more or less, the implementation in many parts of our system. So it, it basically boils down to this. You have the update script on top. The update script, in the case of the calendar, is an Ajax script, which has launched and just iterates over all the cells, asks, do you need to be refreshed? And then I will actually launch your update script. The update script is just a, a jQuery load. So just replacing the internals. Because it's not general, sometimes we need to replace the entire component, sometimes we need to replace the internal, that's why we couldn't abstract this part. So it becomes a, a design pattern. Now, in order to make this a little bit more general, you could actually replace cells by children. That's the, the idea we're working towards. And another part would be, so if you need to um, replace your entire component, so also generate all the JavaScripts again. You can actually not just load, but just use the jQuery replace with and use the render content on instead of the render internal. And that's basically the, the same pattern we've been using everywhere. So that it becomes like you have your, your seaside components hanging as a nice tree, and you can just sell, uh, tell every node in the tree, well, uh, update yourself, and this one will actually propagate and only the necessary changes will get sent to uh, your client. It goes much faster, you don't need any re-rendering. There's much less querying going on, much less rendering. So that was able to give us a performance update of, I think, uh, five times uh, the normal one. So, basic message here is your own session changes, the session changes inside your own session, um, you can use true object-based propagation. I just use the publish subscribe mechanism. And for your concurrent session changes, well, you have to do manual handling. So that was the part on how we dealt with uh, just keeping track of how all the dependencies in a little part of the application, which is shown, how we can actually, well, get a grasp of that and do a very performant update. Another part, very small, but it's cool. There is a Seaside Dynamic SVG package. This was originally created by Holger Kleinsorgen. I don't know if Holger is here. I don't know the person. So this is on, uh, on Squeak Source. Uh, when we got to the package, it was only for Seaside 2.8, so we upgraded that one, and we're adding also the, the SVG jQuery plugin uh, to the system. And then the thing I have to show, 
where do we use SVG? Well, this is just one interface. If you click on here, oh, okay, well, more or less, the colors aren't great, but so you get actually a tree visualization of your event. This is uh, an event of Shakespeare, Othello. So the main root node is here. You've got a timeline of all your events in the system. And it basically animates. So you can focus on the different parts of the system. You can do a fetch more. Uh, these are only the only events which are in my test database. So we're actually focusing just on this one. Um, so this is created with SVG, just rendering, and then also doing just AJAX updates, not re-rendering your entire system on the fly, otherwise you cannot get these uh, nice visual, um, animations. But there is a problem. Yeah, maybe I'll first show here. You can. So actually what it shows is that you have the event, and this is actually the resource planning tool. Your calendar gives you the main overview of all the events in the system, how they are related, gives you basic things. Here, they can do the resource planning because they can say, well, for the event Hotel One, it will be in this room. We need from Theater Techniques, this is in Dutch, sorry. Uh, we need Frank, we need a big PA, we need a small light set, we need a wireless microphone, and so on, and you get the entire planning. The thing is that the things are, why do we have trees? Well, you will have, uh, if you have one uh, performance of Otello, you will probably have them over a long distance of time, and so they're able to plan this uh, visually like this. So what was the issue here? They wanted animations, no question about it. Needed animations, it had to go nicely from one to the other part. So we had to animate SVG. Animating SVG is nice. Adding new content to your SVG, because you saw when I was clicking up and forward, new nodes were added, but you always have these lines. And they were very picky on, no, no, the lines should always be under the date. It's very hard to see. But the lines should always go if you, where is my mouse? Yeah. Lines should always go under here and everything like that. So, um, so you had a, a bit of a challenge. Dynamic loading of SVG content, it's possible, but SVG follows the painter's algorithm. Just go from the top to bot bottom and your Z index in your web page actually just goes up. So the last thing uh, on the bottom of your HTML source page, uh, SVG source page, it will actually contain, uh, will be the highest one, the highest ranked. So basically, you go down, your Z-index goes up in your SVG. So what is already in the jQuery SVG plugin, this is also not our work, there's a plugin created by somebody else, a pure, pure jQuery SVG plugin. We created uh, wrappers for that, uh, for the seaside part. You're able to new load new content in your SVG canvas or add content at the end. So we're stuck. Uh, so what we had to add is to add content to an existing SVG element. Why? You are able to control your z-index if you just make artificial groups, and you know, well, lines always have to go under nodes, so you put all your lines on top, nodes in the bottom. And that's something we added. Um, unfortunately, not yet present on Squeak Source because we're not sure yet either we have to put it into the Smalltalk wrapper or we have to just give it as a patch to the, to the JavaScript uh, person of SVG jQuery. So, but this will soon, uh, soon be released as well. And then the nicest part and the most technical challenging for us was the use of object-oriented databases. Um, we really wanted to keep with object-oriented databases in the system. Um, we've been using Glorp as well for our part, so everything, actually every operation, every user does in the entire system up to the undo, uh, even the undo, uh, it actually locked. Uh, those logs are put into a Glorp database. But for all the rest, the model is particularly complex, has a lot of pointers back and forth, and we really didn't want the hassle of having to map it to a relational database system. And um, on top of that, I think it's nicer to work this way. So we actually started out using Magma. Magma is a great system. Magma has indexed collections, has domestic indexes, has nested transactions. That's really cool if you want to be able to write your database operations in a normal way without having to think too much. And it has a write barrier. Now, what is a write barrier? For those who don't know, I will explain a little bit later on. Unfortunately, as I will show, the performance of Magma didn't really fit our needs. So we ran into a performance problem there, and we decided to move on to goods. And as you see, in goods, you're basically on your own. Huh? 
uh, no index collections, no nested transactions. There is a write barrier support. It wasn't working, and there was no implementation, really, uh, a full implementation of a manual write barrier. So we actually added that. And then I see people of Gemstone looking, so if I make a mistake, you're probably going to hit me afterwards. <laughs> because Gemstone is pretty new, we started about that like uh, one month ago, because also goods wasn't really up to our needs, and we had to scale further. Um, so we're reporting the entire system to Gemstone. It's almost working right now. Um, it has index collections. It doesn't have nested transactions, <laughs> right? Um, it has have a write barrier, although you don't really need a write barrier. Well, it's ex ex completely transparent, so probably it has one. That's why I put a little star there. So our solution, because we didn't want to get tied to Gemstone either, sorry, um, we want to run on multiple databases all the time. So we wanted to keep compatible running into an open source system, any database. So we created a general database access layer, uh, common to, to, uh, database access object terminology, which actually basically abstracts from all the databases. And without changing anything in our application, by just changing this original database access layer, which we designed when we thought we were going to use Magma for forever, um, we're able to actually just continue using that and just keeping the changes local to that database access layer. So we have one specialization for Magma, one for goods, one for Gemstone. Um, and there we put everything in. So what's the right barrier for people um, who are unaware about object-oriented databases? Well, you have your database here on the right. You have your small talk runtime. So you connect to your database and you load your objects. Your objects are in memory, and your database layer just keeps track of which objects are actually loaded. So that in case you change them and you want to do a commit, it just goes through all these objects and will write the changes to the database. The problem is, with goods as a general solution, so without manual write barrier, goods has to go through all the objects to see which one has changed and then just send the change to the database. If you have a manual write barrier, you have a write buffer, and you actually have to manually put the objects you changed into the write buffer. You have to manually do that. Our database access object layer actually takes care of that, so it works. Why do I want that? So you, what do you have to do for a manual write barrier? You have to track changes to your database objects. You have to do that yourself. Every collection, everything, you always have to say, I was changed. So you go through all your objects. You have to use customized collection classes. That was missing in goods as well. Um, so we were, we were adding a lot of um, these custom collection classes because if the collection, class, if the collection object changes, you add something, you have to send the update. And then goods already uses this write buffer. So the support was there. So why? Why? Well, take a look at this. Um, I, I tried to make some benchmarks um, which actually give us representative behavior of what we were seeing inside our application. This one is actually not so important. It just measures, it does a thousand commits. I did a thousand commits on the same machine, and these are the results. Magma in blue, goods with uh, the automatic write barrier in red, um, goods with manual write barrier in the yellow, small, and then gemstone in green. So it's not really useful. You're never doing 1,000 commits one after the other. You're never doing that. So there's no problem, but it just gives you a little bit of a background here. Then, something which mm, sometimes happens, you do a commit of a large collection of objects, of a large set of objects, okay? We just loaded 100,000 objects into the system and we launched one commit. Um, Magma, more or less the same performance. Goods, well, but these are seconds, by the way, on the left-hand side, eh? so if you do that, uh, it really takes a long time. Um, goods with the manual write barrier was actually a lot longer because the manual write barrier um, implementation just takes a lot longer to execute. So if you're doing uh, 100,000 objects, it will always send this change and voila. Gemstone is uh, invisible, so <laughs> lower is better in this case. And then this one is actually the most um, representative one. Um, we have a lot of objects loaded into memory, as I will show you why we need that later on. Um, what if you make one change, one single object you change in your system, and then you launch the commit, which is something you often do. There's lots of objects loaded, one commit. Magma, 
gave me for, for 100,000 loaded objects. Now these were pretty simple objects. Um, you have to think account that the performance also suffers the more instance variables you have in your objects and the more dependencies and so on. But uh, Magma gave me six seconds, so the user actually was hitting add new event in a calendar and then it took six seconds to load. That was not possible. Um, goods with the, uh, without the manual write barrier is as, uh, as performant. Um, goods with manual write barrier is way fast. So it's invisible here because of course we just have the one object and the one object to send and we did it manually. So this is pretty cool. We were very happy with that. Uh, Gemstone actually has exactly the same performance as uh, the, previous, the previous slide where we did a commit of 100,000 of these objects. So it is also very fast. So our candidates for if people want to keep in the open source world, we were sticking with goods, but uh, we're moving to Gemstone. Now why? Well, another benchmark I cannot really show you, but this is the resource planning tool, and you're able to add resources from this place. So you see it is a pop-up window, and they're able to search through resources. So I just hit enter here, and I get a list of all my resources. This is just our test database, who contains about 30, 30 different resources. A customer needs about 5,000 different resources. And the resource is a complex object because it has a cost model associated to it. It has lots of data points. So it's, it's pretty complex, and it represents about the 100,000 loaded objects I was doing in the test. Loading that takes about 20 seconds using goods because it has to create these wrapper classes coming over from the goods database. So when we started this interface, the user has to wait 20 seconds for the first time. So if he opens it the first time, you have to wait 30 seconds before getting it. Not acceptable, unfortunately. Huh? So we have to move to good. So uh, to, sorry to Gemstone, and with Gemstone this worked well almost instantaneous, right? Uh, I cannot be. I cannot say anything else. The thing is that um, what we are trying to do is we, if we keep with goods for, if we, for the good solution is that we will actually do a, a load in the beginning of the application so things are loaded or we do something else. But, uh, well, if anybody has any experience there, I would be happy to talk afterwards. I'll keep this closed. Go here. So... As I was saying, well, yeah, that was the thing. Then, <laughs> our story of Gemstone just, uh, it was all positive until now. Um, uh, until the moment we started to work with these transactions and our uh, concurrent users uh, made changes. So, top user opens the calendar, bottom user opens the calendar, so there's two users using the system at the same time. The bottom user changes one of the objects, uh, changes an event name. The commit happens, so the database is committed. The other user changes the same name. Problem. Huh? Cannot have that. We have to notify the user. Yeah. You cannot see it, but there is a little notification there. So the, the change doesn't propagate, so we capture that. And actually, using our abstraction layer in goods, we were just able to capture that as a transaction conflict. But in Gemstone, huh? so conceptually for us as well, the entire application is completely a transaction conflict. Problem is, in Goods, we were able to create a database session per Seaside session. Gemstone, or Glass, uh, the entire Seaside plus Gemstone integration, has actually what I could call a single database session. If I'm cursing against object-oriented database um, terminology, please tell me afterwards. Um, so the problem there is that we didn't have different sessions. The problem is that when you, do, when you have different sessions with Goods, the thing was that whenever you did a new change, it was able to detect this, no, somebody else, the object just changed in the database, so it's a transaction conflict. Simple to capture. Another thing is that, well, actually all web frameworks uh, which integrate with an object or in the database or with a database in general, they do it this way. The transaction boundary is the request, start and end of the request. That's cool, but uh, we weren't really relying on that because we need something like a conversation. Problem is, of course, your entire application is not designed to run the conversation because when will it end? Uh, this is a conversation for us, the bottom one, where the guy changes the, changes the event name, but the top one as well. So we don't have these really dialogue screens where we could delimit the beginning and the end of a conversation. 
customer wants a desktop-like application in a website. So, as I told you, loading and refreshing loaded objects takes a long time in goods. That was a problem. But the refresh of the database objects, that was happening actually automatically. So we didn't have to take care of that. Uh, and we only did that when the user was able to see the changes on the screen. So when we were refreshing the calendar view, also the objects were refreshed. So we actually, the, the session data was in sync with the uh, client side view. So that's cool, and then you're able to do concurrent changes as a transaction conflict. Now this is then more what, what uh, the gemstone one likes, um, if I can visualize it like that. Cool thing is, loading objects are up to date. This is really fast. Uh, so we always have up to date objects. The refresh is automatic. Your new request comes in, and all the objects actually change. So requests of different users come in interleaved, but all the objects already change. So there are no way of using the database mechanism transactions um, to track concurrent changes. Luckily, we implemented this manual write barrier for goods, and we're actually using that inside of our database access layer to track concurrent changes. So what is the object tracking? We're just using this. Every session keeps this write buffer. We're using the same implementation, and it keeps the side write buffer. Whenever the request for that user comes back in, we can take a look in the history, which other objects were changed by other requests, and then see, oh, you're making a change to the same object. This is a transaction conflict. So we turned off the <laughs> automatic beginning of a request of a transaction. We turned that off, and we have our own, own transactions in there because, well, a transaction error has to be shown as a, a separate window on side of the screen. So in that case, we needed to turn this off. If we can turn it back on, I'm willing to discuss. So how does our entire application access the database? Well, using this, this pattern. This is the only message from the entire application, and it works with all different uh, databases. Let's say, well, session contains a database uh, connection. And then we just have pass it a block, a block which has to execute as a transaction. So everything there, executed, and at the end you do a commit. We pass on several objects because there's just a little problem. Well, first of all, we, we, didn't, we never used the four objects parameter uh, until recently. The idea was to do maybe locking or not, so that the four objects internally would be able to lock those objects. We don't do locking, and we just work with the optimistic uh, transaction mechanism. But now the four objects are needed because sometimes when the objects are deleted, you don't see it. Uh, difficult to explain, but we now need to use it. And then you have three blocks. On success, just execute this. On failure, on failure block is just going to put up the warning screen saying, hey, you changed the name, which another person changed as well. And then we have a retry if. Retry if, well, you can have concurrent changes to the same objects which are completely compatible. So we just put a, a condition there which verifies. So if you change the name of the object, and then somebody else changes the date, that's very compatible. But you will get, a con you will get actually a transaction conflict because you change the same object. So there we just compare, oh, is the name still the same? Okay, so and then we just relaunch the entire transaction inside of our mechanism. So, pretty happy about that. So I think we are actually pretty more cross-database independent. Hmm, I'm almost, well, why? No, yeah. I'm almost at the end. We also have made some hybrid components, which um, after the facts, I think it was a not so good choice. So we started, if you think back about the resource uh, search tool, which was able to show you lots of uh, uh, resources. So, and they said, okay, we have to go through 10,000 different resources and so on. That's cool. Um, problem was, yeah, we have to render interactively. User is searching, he wants to immediately see his things. So what we decided is to serialize the entire object database into JSON arrays, JavaScript site, and generate actually the, the resource finder JavaScript, uh, the client site in JavaScript. So you want better client site interactivity, and C site has some pretty good JavaScript generation. Most of it is, of course, implemented completely in JavaScript separate files, but you need a connection between both, and I just wanted to show that because uh, I think it is a, a really cool thing of, of Seaside. Um, it's on the next slide, so I'll just mention the next bullet here. Um, we do have some scalability problems in that case. Um, if you would be using normal Seaside and doing just the normal thing, because every line inside of this, I'll show you, every line, if I open the resources here, every line here, if I unlock, I can do in-place editing. Uh, so 
what you would do in Seaside is you generate your line and you say, well, this has an in-place edit. Very bad. From the moment that you had about 300 lines here, it took a couple of seconds before the interface became usable again, just because it was registering all those editable fields, all those launching all the JavaScript things. And on top of that, we also have the uh, a needed context menu, so there is lots of things going on. And some of these things are also in place editable. Um, if I'm able to launch here, you get the availability timeline of that resource throughout the dates and so on. So we had some scalability problems. First of all, if you have about 10,000 resources, you don't want to create a passenger, a seaside passenger for your 10,000 objects. Um, <laughs> the callback registry would get huge. I don't know how, what that would cost to seaside or whatever the performance would be, but I'm uh, opted out before that. And you have to think about client-side performance as well. So what seaside has is the cool thing is that you can register a new, uh, just pass a URL for a callback. It has immediate uh, immediate accesses for that. So for example, you can just, I'm assigning things. That's, these are the patterns I'm doing all the time if I have these hybrid components. Part of the resource finder is implemented in Smalltalk. Most of the interactive functionality is implemented in JavaScript. And then JavaScript has to call back. It has to be able to fetch the availability of asking it back to the C side because I'm not serializing that in the first time. It also has to be able to say, well, you are changing this name and so on. So uh, these are the things. You register an Ajax callback and you assign it to some function or you are registering a URL for a particular action to a variable, and those are pretty much the only communication you need if you write two parts, uh, JavaScript and Smalltalk. Found that pretty cool because it has just immediately baked into Seaside. So how am I handling these scalability problems? Uh, the, the thing is that you just have to register your um, in-place editor. When you click on the row, then you register. So you don't do it all the time. You just do one by one. But it means that you have to do client-side programming, JavaScript and you need callbacks. OK, um, we have a lot of tests for our system, mostly unit testing of the model. Um, so we're actually, just for those interested, um, we are using three different frameworks for testing. I hope to merge at least two of them. Um, so unit testing your model, basically a lot of unit tests uh, verifying the uh, integrity of our entire system. But I'm using Seaside testing. Um, I started porting the uh, latest version of David Schaffer uh, who is now implementing it in Visual Work, started porting the new version, uh, um, started that at Camp Smalltalk last time. It actually works now. Uh, so you can actually use the basically entire Seaside testing functionality with Seaside 3. Actually, the, the previous framework I adapted, well, small adaptations actually, as well to work. The only thing we needed was like callback simulation. All the time, try to say, okay, you're actually hitting the right button and you are adding a new event. I want to test that. And basically, the only thing that is in our application is a callback. But with seaside testing, you cannot really do a callback simulation, really do like that. So what do I mean with it? It's basically like this. I write a test, I do some stuff, and then I have a block, say, execute this one as a callback. It creates a request context and everything, and it executes this as an Ajax callback. It should actually change the name. So that only parts of the component change. And that way, I was able to test also lots of the behavior. But the problem is, of course, you don't have client-side testing. We have lots of JavaScript behavior. And for that, I really recommend WebTester, which is using Selenium, uh, Selenium remote control to do uh, client-side testing. So you're able to test your client-side JavaScripts as well. Um, and actually hope to integrate these last two because uh, the new framework of David also uses a, a connection to the browser to use client to do client-side testing. But well, Selenium has a huge user base. Maybe it's better to, to integrate with them. So. Um, just a few remarks, because that's really the, the, hot of the hot of the piece last of the couple of weeks, is we're porting it to Gemstone. I just wanted to give you, for those who are also undertaking the adventure by moving from Faro, uh, developing in Faro and, and uh, deploying onto Gemstone. Um, well, there was a difference between the object-oriented transaction model. Um, really use these grease and lint rules, um, slime uh, and the portability things. Really cool. Really use them, because you will get stuck if you try to port. Um, another thing, differences between Fario and Gemstone we hit a lot was the stricter compiler in Gemstone. Um, yeah, we apparently were pretty sloppy creating empty statements and so on. And of course, everything we tried to load in was every time a setback. And before we actually understood what was going on, what were the errors, it took us some time. Uh, you can no, do no shadowing of variables. So Stefan, actually, this is a call that the compiler in Fario should be more strict. Marcus. <laughs> 
So, um, or we should actually write better code, right? Um, so another thing is that and that uh, that's something we took a while. Um, we're if an error gets thrown, we try to put up a, an automatic connection to a Mantis database and put all the information. We're using exceptions. Uh, you had to create exception A. I'd like to talk about that if that's correct. Um, a block closure is an executable block. I don't really remember why we had to address uh, address that one, but we needed to. And there is some changes. There is some incompatibilities between the date duration and time span protocol, which of course you can imagine we're using a lot. But um, let's see. It seems we're able to handle this. And one thing <laughs> we hit was uh, one one particular uh, missing thing in the current version of Gemstone is assignment to temporaries, because if you have a two callbacks, two AJAX callbacks. Often the trick is to assign a value to a temporary variable and then use it in another callback. The problem is that that doesn't work uh, in Gemstone currently. What you have to do is just put a value holder, put an object, and change the object inside. So don't change the object inside the temporary variable, but change the variable inside that one. So uh, pretty easy to, to circumvent. Actually, we're trying to create automatic transformation rules uh, in the transformation engine of, uh, of Lint for those cases. I uh, haven't really succeeded. I wanted to get it, but I was on holidays last week and didn't want to do that. So, but probably it will come. Okay, so that brings me at the end of the talk. I hope I've been able to, to give you some glimpses of, of, a, of a really new uh, Seaside application, which is very uh, interactive. If you want to see more into depth how this area is working, you want to get a more glimpse, please Ask me, I can give you a, a demo offline. There uh, really is no problem. The problem is if I want to demo every little feature, or um, oh, I'm already out of time right now. Um, so yeah, just this is together with Vurat. They are the customers, and we are going to launch this system uh, also to other cultural centers. The system is currently moving into a beta phase, so we, are finally, we have implemented all functionality. Uh, we are now moving into fixing bugs, hopefully by October, have a first beta version, and normally by the end of the year should actually become available as a web service to uh, other customers. So if you have a, if you are an event organizer, <laughs> or you know one, <laughs> okay. So thank you very much. If there are any questions, I'm happy to take them. Yes. Um, so the question was, um, did you try to use Magma at Cog VM? No. So we're actually not using Cog at the moment. Um, because, okay, we had to use a stable. It's now moving into a stable version. And the Magma interface at the moment is a bit outdated um, because we moved from Magma to Goods, I think, by the end of last year. We started actually this project one year ago, a uh, one-man project, and well, one-man time project. Um, so we will probably try that. But I heard that, indeed, it should be have a better performance in the Koch. But haven't tried it, no. I'm planning, um, I don't think it will be a lot of problem to update that, uh, that specialization of database layer, no. So yeah, why not? I think uh, it won't take us too much time. Uh, at the moment, we're targeting goods in Gemstone. But uh, actually, there's no problem of just updating our Magma specialization layer. Yes, Eor? Any time into Seabreeze while you were taking your decisions? Um, you mean Seabreeze to generate the user interfaces of uh, Seaside? Huh? I know a bit of Seabreeze. Of yes. Yeah. Yes, yes. I've never used it, no. But I don't see exactly why you why you make the remark. Uh, the, you explained some. Of, you, you did a lot of stuff in code, and uh, Seabreeze says, "Okay, I have my model which is separated from my UI." And there are all kinds of change update mechanisms provided ah, okay, in series, and uh, you can do the you basically declaratively do your your UI part with. Oh, I'd be interested to take a look at it. I didn't know that was in there, but yep. Hmm? And it's open source, yes. Sabri, <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, did you uh, consider the image-based persistency also, image as well, a database? Well, yes, um, unfortunately, well, if you use the object or in a database, it looks like you're actually using image-based persistency. So that's what we really wanted. But we need a database for transaction conflicts and so on. So just the database is able to, 
first choice, you have to be, have something persistent outside of the image. So you're able to move it, the data has to be there. Um, and secondly, the transaction conflict mechanism was an immediate target for us to handle the concurrent changes. So immediately we said, okay, we don't do this ourselves, we just delegate this to the database layer so that if concurrent changes happen, we just detect it via the database. So you have to think about this as well, that the idea is now this runs in, um, in a single user, well, an environment where you have one company, uh, maybe like 20 users using it at the same time. But um, I have noticed that um, loading their database, which is they're, they're mimicking the database already a lot with uh, many objects for one or two years of planning already. Uh, it's not in production, so it's like a, a test uh, mirror. Uh, and the, the image grows to 150 megabytes. Uh, but, well, I think the logical choice for persistency is to go for a database. But you want something like an image persistency. But if you want to discuss, no problem. So it won't scale, no, yeah, that's the thing. So, <laughs> with an image based, maybe, yeah, perhaps. One thing to note is that we're trying to some of the stuff in this is, has been flooding back into Squeak source code. The application is not open source itself, uh, but the, the database layer, the goods changes, the updating mechanism, uh, SVG things, um, some of the jQuery plugins and so on, we try to move that as well to the open source. So anything that's remotely usable by anything else, anybody else not targeting event planners, well, <laughs> that's open sourced. Okay, that's it. Thank you.